There are some Midwest winters that seem unrelenting. The cold lingers for weeks while snow and ice pile up, all while people think of spring. These types of winters were difficult for people in the upper Midwest in the late 1800s in states like Minnesota. They yearned for sunny warm day opportunities so that they could get out and care for their animals or travel to get supplies. Unfortunately, one of those sunny days proved to be greatly deceptive as it set up one of the greatest tragedies of the late 1800s, an event known as the children's blizzard or the schoolhouse blizzard. What was this event and why did it get this name? Let's find out here at Learning the Social Sciences. The winter of 1887 and 1888 was a tough one in the American Midwest. In fact, it was part of a six-year period known as a Little Ice Age that had gripped the nation and brought cold air down south, even hitting Texas. By the end of November in 1887, states like Minnesota and Wisconsin were already covered with two to three feet of snow. That much snow at the beginning of an unrelenting winter was a great test for the farmers spread out across the countryside of the vast United States. On January 5, 1888, a sleet storm plowed through the states of the upper Midwest. It laid a coat of ice on top of the trees and on top of the snow. Some trees broke and snap under the pressure. The farmers stayed inside and only ventured out to do essential chores as they slipped about on top of the ice. The cold finally subsided on January 12th and the ice began to melt away as temperatures soared into the 40s. It was the reprieve everyone had been yearning and praying for. Finally, they could catch up on their chores. They could travel and get supplies, or they could go and do other various tasks that they needed to. Some people used the warm day to mend broken fences from the ice storm as trees had fallen on them, or others went to walk off to far corners of the land to see how everything was doing, or to maybe get more hay for their animals. It was a day where people worked with a smile on their face. Due to the warm weather, school children went off to school without their thick winter clothes or gloves. Instead of slipping and sliding to school or freezing while walking in sub-zero temperatures, they felt the warm sun hit their face as they played in the melting snow along the way. It was a glorious morning. What the people did not know, though, was that the Army Signal Corps made a deadly mistake they did not send out a cold weather warning. They knew a storm that would produce an extreme temperature drop was coming down from Canada and across the Rocky Mountains. But for some reason, they did not send out the warning, which caused people to assume that all was well and that the January thaw had come. The January 12th storm was truly unique due to the speed it was traveling at and the winds that it was carrying with it. Around 3 p.m. when schools were letting children go home for the day, the winds picked up and the temperatures began to drop dramatically. Also, snow began to fly in some locations, while in others, ice pellets flew almost diagonally at those that were caught suddenly in these extreme conditions. One individual talked about how these ice pellets caused his eyes to be frozen shut. People who survived the storm discussed how at noon droplets fell off the rooftops. But by around 3 or 3.30, a dark wall came down from the northwest. It was moving fast like thunderstorms in the summer, but when it hit, the winds inside it were like a hurricane. Some areas hit by the storm, like Nebraska, recorded an 80 to 100 degree temperature difference within a few hours. 
temperatures fell to the negative 40s, and in some areas of the Northern Territories, like the Dakotas and Minnesota, they saw temps sink to 58 degrees below zero. The combination was deadly as people became lost and disorientated in zero visibility whiteout conditions. Furthermore, the storm started with 60 mile an hour winds that sounded like freight trains coming. Mixed in with this wind was blinding snow that made it seem like the sun set early as people could not see where they were going, especially on the open plains with few physical markers to help them know their exact location. The snow and wind made for deadly blizzard conditions as people simply had no idea where they were or where they should go. The whiteout conditions were so bad that when a school teacher in Nebraska tried to walk 75 meters with three students, they became lost in the storm's fury. Only the teacher would survive the night, but her feet were so frostbitten that they needed to be amputated. The timing of the storm was deadly, as many schools had let out before the blizzard conditions hit, but it did not give them enough time to make it home. Some teachers kept their children at the school, like Seymour Dopp of Pawnee City, Nebraska, who had enough wood to keep them warm until the parents made their way through five-foot drifts to rescue them the next day. Minnie Freeman, also in Nebraska, kept her children at the school as well, but the fierce winds tore the roof off of the small schoolhouse. She then decided to quickly tie up all of the children so that they could walk together with the rope keeping them together a mile and a half to her house. Luckily, they all survived. One family in Minnesota was not as lucky, though, as the Freeman students. Six children from the Baker's family all froze to death while trying to make it home from school. When they were found the next day, their frozen bodies were still holding on to each other. A town in Warner, South Dakota, reported that all of the students and the teacher had perished. Some people who passed away in the extreme weather were not found for days, weeks, or even until the snow melted in the spring. The exact number of people that were killed is unknown. It is estimated that between 200 and 500 people died during the storm, with 235 being the most cited number from the blizzard itself. But hundreds more died in the days and weeks after the event from pneumonia or from infections from amputations done due to frostbite. The storm was traumatizing due to the amount of children who died trying to make it home from school or the parents who died trying to find them. Additionally, many farmers lost their lives as they were unable to make it home in time or they perished when they left their house to get more supplies like coal or wood to heat their house. One young couple ran out of coal in the middle of the storm and because the wife started to show that she was going into labor, the husband ran out, ran to town to go and get coal. It took him three days to make it home to his wife who had given birth while he was away but he was able to survive because he hid on out in a pig stall. The storm also left physical scars with the survivors who had frostbite scars or missing limbs or fingers. The blizzard impacted a large area as the storm hit the Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa, and Nebraska. For decades to come, January 12th was a day of mourning especially for those that lost family members. Clubs were formed for survivors that met much like a support group, consoling each other as their memories of that fateful day lingered. If you have any questions or comments about this horrendous storm, leave it down below. Also remember to hit the like and subscribe button so you know when we post more videos. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.